tapes at different television channels. And Sergei Posad and Krasnoyarsk television channel, they will for sure broadcast the best film produced by a person with disability in team with a professional journalist. Um, and do you know how many people with disabilities are there in the world? Can you estimate? About a billion. One billion people. One million. This means that one out of seven persons has some form of a disability. And very often it can be a disability which is not visible immediately. When we think of a disability, there are often associations with a person in a wheelchair or a person having a physical disability, but also there are lots of other disabilities about which we don't even know. For example, when they invite me to a project to speak about disability, they expect, they, know, they never met me before, and they expect to see a woman in a wheelchair. And then there is some blonde coming in, and they ask him where is this expert on disability who is disabled herself. So in, in this way I'm breaking stereotypes that disability is very different. It's a very diverse group of persons with disabilities who all have different needs and interests. And so in our project right now, we have uh, a few people who are wheelchair users, we have people with visual impairment, people with uh, hearing impairment, and also I think in Krasnoya we will have uh, a few or one or two participants with uh, Down syndrome, and there will be a few deaf-blind participants. So it is a challenge, you also learn a lot, how to work with different people with disabilities in one room. And I'm also trying to help journalists to enable them to work with persons with disabilities, because for many of them it's a completely new world. And also trying to help John to think of how we can better present disability and what would be the best stories, personal stories, of people with disabilities that can be broadcast and displayed in the media, thus raising awareness about a disability, which all of us may have, sorry, which all of us may have any day, which I don't know. Okay, I see that everything is fixed right now, right, John? Almost. Almost. Okay. Okay. So, do you have any questions so far about the project um, with which we came to Sergei Posad and to Moscow? If you have any questions, feel free to ask. What are their cities that you target? Sorry, I... I what are their I'm cities? I'm hard of hearing, I'm there, but I cannot hear from here. Uh, Maybe, what um, are their cities? No, the, mic the microphone is, is, is not working. What are other cities that you are working with? Wait a moment. I'm dealing with different magic tactical equipment as well. I have the same problem as John over here. It's just a different equipment. Uh, it's Sergeyev Posad at the moment. And it's Krasnoyarsk. And so tomorrow evening, John and Olga is going to Krasnoyarsk and I'm following them. Actually, uh, we also have participants from Moscow. A few of them, but they will be working with the station, TV station in Sergei Posad. And journalists at the TV station will work. They're very enthusiastic about the project. They're ready to help in teaching how to edit the video materials and so on. And they also have a camera for working uh, on this project. And we have a few people from St. Petersburg. The idea is that they should find a TV journalist or TV station that would support them to, um, to give assistance in editing equipment also and um, access to information and also perhaps to air the movie on, on the channel. So far we are looking for TV station that would support us and we hope we succeed because we really need that. So, we just started, there's a lot to do, and there is a risk, there is a certain risk, but it's worth it. Okay, thank you.
John, I think. Um, we're think starting, we're starting with here. Here's the lights. Oh, this is going to be really easy. These are the lights. Um, wow, perfect. Oh, you can turn them completely off when we do it, okay? Um, so just before we start, uh, one or two other things about this project, because I don't know if any of you want to uh, get involved in it. Um, we're doing the same parallel training and pairing in New York, and we're taking people with disabilities in New York and pairing them with filmmakers, and we have support from our local public television station, and they're going to broadcast the, the films. They're not as supportive as the TV stations here. The TV stations here are much more generous with their time and more enthusiastic. Uh, public television in the United States is pretty bad. Uh, so uh, we did the best we could. And then in the springtime, the teams are going to trade places. And the Americans are going to come here and visit Sergei Posad and Krasnyarsk, and the Russians get to go to New York. Um, what else? We also are going to have a special uh, festival of films that get made um, at the new Moscow Documentary Film Theater. If you, anybody been to that theater yet? Yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they have uh, very good facilities. They're building a, a video library there uh, that's going to have the best documentaries from around the world. Uh, so that's a very good resource for anybody. So if anybody wants to participate in that project, uh, Olga's in charge here. You see Olga every day, and you can talk with her about that. So uh, let's talk about video and using video to change things. Um, right, so you guys are all studying economics. And my mother uh, really wanted me to go work on Wall Street. And there was a guy down the street from us who had a seat on the stock exchange. And so she thought this was my family's ticket into great wealth. And so she, she got him to give me a job working for his company. And we lived in the suburbs and it took about two hours every day driving into New York to go to this job that, that I was able to get. So can you imagine I'm, I'm 17 years old, I'm sitting next to some guy in a suit who all he's thinking about is stocks and derivatives and things like that. And all I'm thinking about is can I get some girl to go to the movies with me that night and why can't I be at the beach instead of being in this guy's car. We have nothing to talk about. And I get to, to, to the job. And it was just when they were beginning to computerize the stock trades on Wall Street. And so every stock had its own computer record. And then it had the IBM punch cards. This was really primitive stuff. They had the actual order number from the floor and the stock certificate. And my job, my great job on Wall Street, was to count through these stacks. There was about five or six stacks that were two or three feet high of the day's trades and to make sure that all the numbers matched because in those days the computers were so inaccurate they never matched. And so my job was just count, 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 count. Then get in the car for another two hours driving back to this guy. And it was a disaster. So I was looking for a way to get out. And um, I had a girlfriend who was um, at the local college and we went out on a big date, eight guys, eight girls, and when we were coming back to the, to the college, one of the girls' stomach rumbled. And um, I said, well, I'll take you out to get something to eat. And she says, there's no restaurants open. So we got an idea. This was the first time I had a business idea. And so I said, listen, can we come uh, the next day with some sandwiches and we'll sell them to the girls? And they got permission, it was a Catholic school. We showed up the next day with 20 sandwiches. There were 50 girls waiting. And they're screaming and they're throwing money at us. And we, wow, this is really great. Come back the next night with 100 sandwiches. Now there's 200 girls. <laughs> and, and the sandwich, they just, like we were rock stars. And they're grabbing the sandwiches. And, and I don't think we got any money, but. Uh, we got pretty excited. The next night, we come back with about 200 sandwiches. It was 500 girls waiting. So um, 
I said, this is what I want to do this summer. And uh, we got permission from the head of the school to come and sell sandwiches. So quit my job on Wall Street. My friend quits his job. We take our savings. We had about $200 each. And we buy an old truck, uh, a slicing machine, and we start making sandwiches. And we show up the first day, and they won't let us on the campus. And they decided that we were too much of a risk to the girls to allow us to come on. So now we have quit our jobs. We've made this investment. We decide we're going to sell sandwiches at the local factories. We go to the first factory. In my town, they made Lifesavers, the Lifesaver candy. And we sold about 20 sandwiches. Every day we sold 20 sandwiches. That was enough. Uh, but on Friday, the factory closed for vacation. And it never reopened. We went to another factory where they made nuts and bolts. We sold about 15 sandwiches a day. And on Friday, factory closed and never reopened. And it was the beginning of the deindustrialization of my town. And eventually, every single factory in my town closed. And it got worse uh, for us that year. It took us about two months to realize that um, we were complete failures in the business world and that uh, we better go and find some other job for the rest of the summer. Um, so I, I got a, golf, a job working at a golf course, uh, and my friends uh, went to work in his family's uh, liquor store. And that was sort of the, the beginning and the end of my business career. But when I was your age, the United States was, was sort of on fire. Um, this was in the late 60s, early 70s. And I built the machine already. Um, the, the type of stuff that's going on in Ukraine right now, where people uh, fighting in the streets, the type of things that um, are happening all over the world where people are fighting for better education, better rights, we were all part of that. Except, once again, I was a failure. And we were doing a lot of community organizing and nothing was working. So we were fighting for better schools, schools stayed bad. Fighting for better health care, fighting against the war in Vietnam, getting beaten up by the police, um, wasn't very successful. And one of the big problems that we had in our neighborhood was the schools. The schools were supposed to be democratically run. There was supposed to be an elected board that would operate the schools and carry out the wishes of the parents. Unfortunately, um, a really nasty mafia took over the school board, hired all their friends, stole all the money. Whenever they had a meeting like this, they would never let the parents talk, even though the bylaws said that the parents have the right to talk. And the parents complained, but nobody would listen to them. The parents went to court, and nobody would listen to them. So finally they came to us. We had one of the early video cameras, and they said, will you please help us? Will you please bring your camera to the next school board meeting so you can record what happens, because nobody believes that this is going on in America. So this is one of the first videos that we ever made. And it's at one of our school board meetings. And this is what used to happen. This was democracy in action in New York City. Okay, let's see if I can make this work. Ooh, mouse. Okay, great.
So, sometimes at these meetings they had more police than parents. <laughs> and, and they had uh, this a special group of police called the Tactical Police Force, the TPF. Uh, and in order to be in the TPF, you had to be at least six foot three and over 250 pounds. And those were the guys that used to come and end the meetings by beating up the parents. So they, they beat me up pretty bad a couple of times too. Uh, and when this tape was taken to the authorities and when, when it was taken to the judge, for the first time they paid attention. And they realized that something terrible was going on in the school and they dismissed the evil corrupt school board uh, and ordered another election and a group of honest people that represented the parents took control of the schools and the schools improved. So, for somebody who had failed at everything he'd ever tried before, failed in my job in Wall Street, failed in community organizing, failed to make the hockey team when I wanted to be a hockey player, all of a sudden, when I used this camera, we accomplished something. And something changed, and something became better. So we said, oh, this is pretty cool. Let's fix everything in our neighborhood. <laughs> so the next place we decided to start was with the healthcare system. Uh, healthcare system in the United States was a mess back in the early 70s, and it's a mess today. Uh, it's just a different type of mess. But in those days, and unfortunately today, there was a tremendous disparity between the healthcare that rich people got and the healthcare that poor people got. And if you were wealthy, you could get the finest healthcare in the world. Uh, people from everywhere come to the United States for health care if they have the money to pay for it. But if you didn't have the money, you could get health care that resembled the health care in the third world country. And that's the type of health care that I got because I didn't have any money. When the police used to beat me up, I used to sit in the hospital for hours and hours and hours and hours waiting for some tired doctor. And we decided to make a film about that and hope that we could get the same results that we had gotten with the film about the school board. So I went to every single hospital in New York and finally got allowed to film at Kings County Hospital. It's the biggest hospital in New York City. It's the hospital that when you're poor and when you're sick and you live in Brooklyn, this is where you go. Unfortunately for the people, and we're talking about economics here, if you're running a government, and you don't have any money, and you need to cut the budget, what are you going to cut? You're going to cut the police? Not a good idea. Because you're going to need the police when the people get angry. But also the police are organized, and if you cut their salary, like they've tried to do only once in New York, every single policeman gets on the Brooklyn Bridge and marches over to City Hall, stops traffic, closes the city down, they can't cut the police budget. Can you cut the firemen? Can you cut the firemen? Can you cut the teachers? Teachers will go on strike and close down all the schools. They tried. They can't succeed. But if you're sick, you're not in a union. You haven't selected to be sick. This is a pretty vulnerable population, and this is a good population if you're going to cut. It's a good place to start. So they would cut the health care budget. And this was a time when New York City was bankrupt. They had no money. They were taken over by a special authority, and the first place they cut was in the hospitals. In this hospital, it's a pretty scary place. Um, they um, got rid of many of the specialists. Uh, maybe they would only have one cardiologist. They certainly wouldn't have a cardiologist there in the hospital. They would only call them in if they needed them in an emergency. They reduced the nursing staff in half. Uh, they stopped ordering supplies. They only had one of everything. So, for example, if the microphone broke, microphone broke. They also decided to save money, uh, this is interesting economically, by firing all the people that fixed the equipment. <laughs> they, they, they did outsource some of this, but it was so expensive to outsource it that they just stopped. And so if something broke, it broke. So. One night we're filming in this hospital and in comes a man named Mr. Spinelli. Mr. Spinelli had just had a heart attack. Um, they shocked him back to life. 
I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that before, but it was a miracle. The guy was dead, and they brought him back to life. But something inside the evening, when you go into business, every once in a while, you're going to have to play a hunch. And there's going to be something tingling somewhere in your body, like behind your ear or your little toe, that tells you that even though it doesn't make that much sense, you should go off in this particular direction. And something was tingling when Mr. Spinelli left that emergency room breathing again. And so I decided to follow him. So they took him up to the intensive care unit, again, where they have half the nurses, no specialists, uh, nobody fixing the equipment, no extra supplies, and I'm waiting. One day, two days, my, my crew leaves me. They've had enough of this, and they think that this is like just a, a waste of time. But um, on the fifth night, Mr. Spinelli had another heart attack, and here's what happened because of all these cutbacks.
it was difficult, it would actually some part be harder now. Um, we have a new law in the United States that uh, guarantees privacy to people who are in hospital settings. Um, and you have to get their uh, consent before you can film them. And when you're coming into the hospital in the most dramatic time, like in the emergency room, I can't be running alongside with you. Would you please sign this piece of paper? It's not going to happen. But we had negotiated with the hospital to get access. And the public relations director of the hospital thought that if people saw the actual conditions in the hospital, that they would be outraged and the cutbacks would stop. And that's why they let us in. Um, also, I, they, they, we showed up every day in the hospital. We were there before they started work. When they went home, we were there. We showed that we were committed to um, making a good film. And so they continued to let us stay there. Unfortunately, well, first it started off fortunately. When the program was broadcast, uh, it really caused a shock. Because this wasn't the only person that was dying on camera. There was a little baby. Uh, we called him the green baby because he had some horrific form of juvenile cancer that was causing him to die and be green. Um, and his family was $5 over the limit for government help with medicine. And because of this $5, they couldn't get the medicine. And the doctor was just looking in the camera and said, this kid is going to die. I don't understand a country like this when you can con condemn a kid to death because his parents have five dollars too much, and the kid died. Um, they had the only uh, radiation treatment for people who had no money in all of Brooklyn, half of Queens, and Staten Island. So that's for eight million people, there was one machine. And so the waiting list for this machine was so long that by the time you got in front of this machine, your simple cancer was basically terminal. And the ward for this machine was just one of the scariest places. Tubes, tubes, people half dead, looking like skeletons. And the machine was so old, and the beam of radiation so diffuse that it irradiated more healthy tissue than the cancer. And they actually, the staff called the machine the killer. And they would say, okay, bring in another one for the killer. It's like taking a lamb to the slaughterhouse. So this got broadcast. Everybody went crazy. And um, they uh, passed a new budget that committed more funds to the hospital. And they began to fix up all the services that we had shown in the film. So, again, this was extremely rewarding because we felt that we had, with our film, changed something in the healthcare system. Unfortunately, about six months later, the financial crisis for the city deepened. They needed to cut the budget, and the first place they cut was at the hospital. So, they decided to fire the nice public relations lady that had led us into the hospital. They declared that everything that we had shown in the film was untrue. And we got blacklisted from public television for the next 20 years. Oh. So, um, and, and, and we didn't really see that coming, but it turns out there was one part of the program in which we attacked the pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies was one of the all. This is all economics, it's pretty interesting. The pharmaceutical uh, companies were one of the most profitable sectors of the American economy. They had uh, uh, profits in excess of 30% year after year after year. They could charge whatever they wanted for the drugs. The hospitals were on a fixed budget. They would appropriate the money for the drugs. Price gets raised. Price By the time August rolls around, the hospital was out of money for drugs. The pharmacy was empty, the people get the prescriptions, they stand online, they get up to the window and they can't get their drugs. Plus we filmed the guys from the pharmaceutical companies coming around giving free drugs to the doctors and all sorts of presents so the doctors would write 
prescriptions for the most expensive medicine. Turns out that five of the top ten corporate funders for our local public television station were these pharmaceutical companies. So that was the last time we worked in public television. So uh, sometimes we win the fight and sometimes and this was a, a time where the film had a very, very strong impact, but it ended our career in public television. Um, one of the things that we get to do is we get to go to places uh, that other people can't go, and we become the eyes and ears of, of our country and sometimes the world. And so uh, the United States was involved in a very a long war in Vietnam. It used to be the longest war in the history of the United States until this current war in Afghanistan. Um, it was the first war that the United States ever lost. And everybody was wondering what had happened after the war. Uh, we had been told that unless we stayed in Vietnam and won the war, that everybody in Vietnam was going to die or become enslaved or whatever. So this was a big deal going back to Vietnam as the first American and trying to bring back um, some, something that would help Americans understand how complicated the mix of the two cultures were now, the latent effects of the war, what happened to the people who used to be officers in the South Vietnamese Army, uh, people who were taken away to places they call Hok Tap or re-education camps. We were told they would all be killed. Would we find any of them alive? Would they like America? What was going on? So here is um, one of the reports from this trip to Vietnam. And it, it, it's just a simple story of going to lunch in a Vietnamese restaurant that's unlike any restaurant that you guys have ever seen. On the outside, there's only a hint that this restaurant is a little bit unusual. Inside, looks pretty normal. But we couldn't read the menu and we made the mistake of asking for the special of the day. Has he been bitten before? Has he been bitten before? Six times? Yeah, six times. About a year ago. About a year ago he was bitten, huh? This is a cobra? Yeah, this is a cobra. That's your mother? Yeah. Mama cooks the snake. And this is lunch for you. Lunch, lunch for me. Snake food. Snake 
Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Fried snake. That's right. Okay. What's this? The bat. And that's the bat. Yeah, the bat. Snake and bat. What is this? This is the yeah. snake and bat blood with wine. That's the snake and bat blood with wine. Uh huh. Yeah. Get back to my friend. Let's see if he'll drink that. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah, what? <laughs> Songs. By the Red Cloud. Did you go to buy the record? Yes. Uh, did you ever go in the United States? Yes. Uh, when? Uh, 1969. 69? Yes. What were you doing? Pilot. Oh, you were learning how to fly in the yes, Air Force. Yes, fly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you came back here with the South Vietnamese Air Force? Yes. Uh -huh. And what happened to you after the war? The happened. Of the work for me, I'm going to get hopped up. Oh, you went to the re education camp? Yeah. Ah. And how many years? Four years. Four years and they let you out? Uh -huh. Yes, four years, get out. Do you have any problems now? It's now. It's okay now? I think so. You hope so? Yeah. Uh huh. Play one more song for me. Inside it? Three dangerous snakes. Three dangerous snakes? Yes. Uh -huh. And what are, what are you doing with it? To drink. Yeah. Uh huh. You, now we keep for you yeah. and to bring back to New York, your country. Yeah. Okay. Alright, thank you. You like it? I'll bring it back. Okay. Thank you. Snakes on the Plane, that movie? Mm -hmm. yeah. Nobody's seen Snakes no, on the I Plane? Don't. It's one of the greatest movies in history. Well, not really, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's about, what is it, Sam Samuel L. Jackson? Yeah. Gets on a plane with some terrorists, and the terrorists have, have put, you know, it's like 5,000 cobras and pythons and coral snakes, and let them out on the plane so that the, the plane would go down uh, like a terrorist uh, incident. Anyway, it felt like that. So that was tasty, though. That was really good. Um, and what about the heart? Heart, I just, just swallowed it. Boom. Yes. Oh. You know, and but you could feel it beating. Uh, and that was really gross. <laughs> now, since that time, there's been 50 other reporters who have found this place and have gone there. Uh, Where's the Where city? Is it? It's in uh, Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. And and. You know, every time I went back, it was like a like a bigger dare. Uh, and you know, one of the things that the Vietnamese liked was that, like, okay, I'll, I'll eat the snake heart. And then the next time they wanted me to eat uh, a barefoot. Uh, and then there was some elephant restaurant that they were trying to take me to, and I just didn't want to go because I didn't want to eat the poor elephant. Um, but I ate rats and cats and dog. Um, if you go to oh really gross anybody ever go to Kazakhstan? I was. Did you did you have to eat the stuff that they eat there? I uh, not I, I think not uh, the original. Uh, oh. I mean more usual for Russian. Like monkey and that type of stuff. No. no. <laughs> There's no such stuff. What did you What did you eat? Normal food. 
Normal food. Okay. So the first the first day they take the first day they take me uh, because I'm interested in uh, in kumis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys ever have kumis? Yeah. Okay, so, right. So I was interested in kumis. So they take me to this restaurant and they feed me horse meat, and I don't want to eat the horse. You know? uh, and then they take me out because uh, I wanted to see the the, um, the milk horses, and they bring me out in the countryside, and they take you to a yurt, and they have this ceremonial dinner, in which they kill a sheep, and they save certain parts of the sheep for the honored guest. So the first thing you do is you eat the sheep's lips so that you can speak wisely. Uh, and you're eating the sheep's ears so that you can hear what you want to hear. Um, the sheep's eyes were really gross uh, so that you could always have clear vision. And then the final part is you eat the sheep's brain uh, so that you can always have good thoughts. That was really gross. Uh, but you have to do this type of stuff. I'll, I'll tell you a story where I made a mistake. Um, I go into Iraq and um, it was just after the United States had invaded. Everything's blown up. There's no electricity. There's no running water. There's dead bodies in all the water. So you can't drink anything. And I have friends and I want to go visit them and see how they're doing. They're so excited. Can you imagine like if you're in a war zone and your buddy from the United States shows up to see if you're okay? So the whole neighborhood comes to meet me. So I'm in this house, and they want to feed me because they want to be hospitable. And I don't want to eat anything. And so they say, well, what do you want? Uh, and I refuse everything. So finally I agreed um, that I would eat eggplant. What's, what's the Russian word for eggplant? Huh? Baklajan. So I'm going to eat baklajan. I figure like, I can't get sick from bak baklajan. Right? <coughs> so they make this giant plate of baklajan. And they ask me, do I like uh, some vegetables on top of it? And when you travel, you should not eat uncooked vegetables if you're in a strange place, especially one where there's lots of dead bodies in the water. <laughs> and so I say, no, I don't want any vegetables. Oh, please, no, please, 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 everything, please, please. And there's 30 people in the room to watch me eat. <laughs> so I say, well, okay, a little bit. They take this parsley, like a mountain, <laughs> stick it on top of the baklaja. And I go, uh oh, I'm in trouble. Because it's not like, um, like there's a dog under the table and you can like take him, like feed it to the dog. And there's all these people watching me and I have to eat and I have to eat everything. Otherwise, I'm disrespectful. So I eat all this stuff and I know I'm in trouble. They want to know what I want to drink. So I tell them I want tea. And they said, it's 120 degrees outside. I said, yeah, but I want tea because I know at least it'll be boiled, right? And they won't accept that for an answer. So finally, uh, I agree that I'll have some Pepsi. So that, do I want ice? No! I don't want ice, right? <laughs> please have ice, please have ice, please have ice, right? So finally, okay, I'll have some ice. I have no idea where they got this ice from because there isn't electricity around for 30 miles. Okay? So the next day, I am so sick, I want to die. You know, I'm living in the bathroom, it's coming out both ends, but I have to work. And you guys, if you're going to be international businessmen or businesswomen, you need to be careful about what you eat because if you go into negotiations and you're in the condition that I was in, you can't do what you want to do. But I had no choice. So I made diapers for myself. I went and I got uh, some paper towels and I folded them up and put them inside my pants. And I went out and I filmed for three hours, came back, changed my diapers, went out again. So... Why am I telling this story? Anyway. <laughs> uh, she wrote to ask John. Huh? She wrote to Oscar. No, I'm not going to do that. I, I changed the, the, the lecture. Even though Mary Shea's here, Mary Shea's seen this particular uh, series of tapes about a hundred times. She could actually give this, give this lecture, so I feel really sorry for her. Um, but you go um, places where nobody is. Um, hopefully you have a team with you. But sometimes, um, nobody wants to go to these places. And so, um, I was in Nicaragua. And I was in Nicaragua with a lot of very heavy equipment. And in those days, the cameras weighed 35 pounds. That's why I'm short now, because I used to carry these heavy cameras. Uh, they also had another box that was...
was around 20 pounds. They had all the extra circuitry. Then they had a recorder. Uh, the recorder weighed about 30 pounds. So altogether, there was about 75, 80 pounds worth of equipment. And you would divide this between two people. And the cameraman would have the camera. And the sound man would carry the rest of the stuff and also usually uh, hold the microphone. So we get to the war zone in Nicaragua. This is a, a, a war in which um, the United States is supporting really bad people. And I'm on the other side showing how evil the United States is. Uh, and we get bombed by a plane that is from the United States. It has an American bomb in it. And it lands around where the camera is, blows this gigantic hole in the ground. My cameraman pees in his pants. Uh, he's so frightened and leaves me and goes back to New York. So I had 75 pounds worth of equipment. And, and what they did is they went out in the forest and they cut a, a, a pole for me and some vines from the forest and they hung... Um, some of the equipment from one side of the pole, some of the equipment from the other side of the pole, tied the microphone to the top of the camera. And this is how I went around, how do you say ox in, in, in Russian? The big, the big things that plow the field. Sort of like a bull, but even bigger. And so that's uh, sort of what I, I look like. And I came back and I, I had a meeting with Sony. And I said, listen guys, please. Can't you figure out how to make these cameras smaller? And can't you figure out how to put everything into one piece so that one person can handle it? Because sometimes nobody wants to go to these places except me. And so they actually did invent a one-piece camera. And this is the first time anybody ever used it. Uh, back in, in Nicaragua, again, being attacked by, um, by my own tax dollars. Uh, but you'll see how this camera actually helped save, save my life. <laughs> This had a power 
that the normal reports didn't have. Because when the soldier in Nicaragua is talking to me, and I'm filming him from behind the camera, and I'm talking to him, when the Vietnamese guy is singing, and he's talking to me, and he's looking at me behind the camera, and I'm asking him questions, he's looking directly into the lens. And so when the audience at home turns on their TV sets and they're sitting in Moscow or Kaluga or someplace else like that, it's almost like they're in the living room or in, in your kitchen in Kaluga talking to you. And it created an immediacy that reports hadn't had. Now, I didn't think about this. It just sort of happened by accident. Once they tied all that stuff on the camera and I began asking the questions from over here, people began talking to me. Now, I'm not in the reports except when I'm eating snake hearts. You won't see me any other time. Uh, there's no narration, because I don't want to hear my voice. I think, my voice is Who wants to hear that? Uh, and I would like to create an environment in which I, I'm transporting the audience to the place. So, well, the reporters didn't like this. Uh, you got any idea why the reporters? I mean, what was the biggest thing that upset the reporters about this style of reporting? Because we don't need them anymore. <laughs> you can't, well, it's, it's sort of part of this. You can't see them anymore, all right? They, they don't have any face. And if you ever look at the, look at the stuff that's going on now in, um, in Ukraine, the reporter's always between you and what's going on. And they're really excited. And I'm here in Ukraine. And something's going on over their shoulder. But they're there. And that's the thing that they're most excited about. <laughs> They spend all day long thinking about that part of their report. Um, they carry things with them so that they'll look better. It's hard in the nighttime in Ukraine, but they come with the reflectors. Um, I noticed once um, all the reporters were carrying briefcases with them. And they were carrying briefcases to places that they didn't need briefcases. And I just couldn't understand why they had them. And anybody can imagine what's inside the briefcases? Makeup. Makeup. Exactly correct. <laughs> Full of makeup. And so, in the middle of uh, Nicaragua, in the middle of any place, out comes them to make themselves up and doing their stand up. And then, so filming right in the middle of that thing, they, they put the makeup and then Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, these reports were very popular with the audience because it demonstrates a certain amount of respect for the audience. Um, that you believe that they're smart enough to interpret things without you telling them. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not editing them uh, and that we're, um, that I'm just sitting around like a, like a tree. Uh, but I am appreciative of the ability of the audience to understand things without me treating them like they're in the third grade. Um, and it made the reports really powerful. And people would... Um, hear that I'm on television, uh, John Albert's going to be up next, and they would come running into the kitchen with their toothbrush so they could watch this in the morning. Uh, and very, very high ratings for these reports, but also began to influence the government. So uh, the next report is one that really had a profound influence on American foreign policy. Um, the United States was supporting a really evil dictator in the Philippines named uh, Ferdinand Marcos. Anybody ever hear of this guy? Yeah. Huh? What do you know about him? <laughs> well, just a look here. Uh, this for uh, about 30 years. And uh, he, he, he was good in uh, uh, dividing and, and ruling. So, he, he, he was a, a real kleptocrat. Yeah, and, and, and this, this also. So there, there's a paper by, by Terence Mullins. Uh-huh. And, and, and he stole everything. Um, one of the wealthy, became one of the wealthiest people in the world. His wife was famous uh, because she had the world's largest shoe collection. Um, when they finally had the revolution, they broke into her uh, closet. It was uh, half the size of this auditorium only shoes. And the United States was supporting this guy. And it was all part of the Cold War, and uh, he said that he was against the Communists, so as long as he said he was against the Communists and he was against the Soviet Union, we supported him. 
Uh, he also gave us uh, space in the Philippines for our military bases as part of the Cold War. Uh, and people in the United States couldn't understand why the people weren't happy because he was always presented as a friend of the United States. Why did the people hate him so much? So we went to the Philippines to find out. And we were trying to demonstrate the disparity between the extraordinary wealth that Marcos had accumulated for himself, thanks to the support of the American government, and the life of the poor people in the country. And we found the perfect place to do it. Um, it was called Smoky Mountain. Smoky Mountain is the largest dump in the Philippines. It's right in the middle of the capital, Manila. It's where all the garbage comes. It's called Smoky Mountain because of all the garbage decomposing. And 7,000 people live on top of the garbage and get their living from scavenging the stuff that people throw away. So this is the smoking Mountain Report. <coughs> no, it's not. But anyway, well. I figured it out. Ooh. What's this, a, a, a big dump? It has been commonly known among people as the Smoky Mountain. So now you can see the garbage smoking coming from uh, the methane gas it produces. Why do the people stay here? Scavenging, particularly scavenging, you know, picking up garbage and selling them. So that's why the people live next to the dump? Yes. Uh -huh. My goodness. Hi, kids. Hello. Hello, hello. Gogo, yes. any of these kids go to school? Uh, some of them, yes, uh -huh. but up to only up to grade 3. Grade 3? Uh, because after that, they uh, help in the family to for additional income. Like what? Like that? Like there? Uh, yeah, scavenging again. And what are those people doing down there? They're cleaning uh, uh, the things that they have salvaged from the garbage. What? What's your name? Maria. Maria? Yeah. How old are you? Um, 18 years old. 18? Yeah. Where are you going? I'm <laughs> a little tambacal. Up over there? To the to the dump? Yeah. Maria, how many years have you been doing this? Many, many years. Some metal? Yeah. Uh -huh. 
I want to spend life for my baby. So, e even though um, the United States government was doing the wrong thing, uh, in general, the American people are, are nice people, and they know the difference between right and wrong, and when they saw that, they didn't like it. Uh, and so they began to complain, uh, and it wasn't only me that was doing this, but there were other reporters who were bringing back news about the extraordinary corruption in the Philippines. And uh, in a few months, it became impossible for the United States government to continue to support this guy. And when they withdrew their support, he was gone in, in, in two months. And how did you manage to deliver your messages to the audience? You mentioned about the blacklists and all the things. Okay. So, when I got blacklisted from public television, um, I, I never thought about working for anybody else. You know, I never thought I was going to be a, a TV reporter, right? I was a taxi cab driver. And uh, one of the first films we made was about the injustices that the taxi drivers were facing. And it was a very effective film, helped us organize the taxi drivers. Um, and so I never really considered myself a reporter. I just sort of like fell into this. Um, and we got much better at what we did. Uh, we used to show all our films on the street. And sort of like a street musician down in Arbat. And if you know, was they didn't put any money in, in a guitar case, but if they stood around and they watched the films, uh, we knew that we had a good film. And so that's how I started. Uh, we got better, and we would go places that nobody else would go, maybe because we weren't so smart, um, or maybe because we had something, some ideals inside us that that made us braver than than we deserved to be. And. Um, when I got blacklisted from public television, I just thought that, that was the end and I'd never make another film. But because we had been to Vietnam, we had sort of learned that things were going to be happening in Vietnam that nobody else knew. And we, we figured out that Vietnam and China were going to go to war. And nobody else figured that out. So we had asked for a visa to go to to Vietnam, it takes six months in those days to get a visa. It used to take months to get a visa to come to Russia. To, it, it, the world was a different place. And the visa arrived the day the war started. And the, oh, I'm going to talk about something. This, this is going to be interesting. The, the vice president of the public television station felt sorry for us that we had lost our jobs trying to be honest and that we were doing a good job but we'd lost our jobs. And he had had a similar thing happen to him but for different reasons. He was NBC's star war reporter in Vietnam. He was big, smart, handsome, and he was gay. And he was one of the first people of his public stature to come out. And when he came out, that was it. And he lost his job. And so he sort of understood from his own perspective what it's like to lose your job and not know what you're going to do next. He was working at public television because uh, public television was not homophobic and he was able to get a job there. But he still was respected by many people at NBC and he sent us over to NBC. And they didn't have anybody else who would get into Vietnam. They didn't have anybody else who knew the war was going on. And they said, yeah, why not? And so they sent us. And so our reports from this battlefield were very dramatic footage that nobody else had. From there, we discovered the last American prisoner of war. He was the only guy left. We found him, and we helped bring him back to the United States. We got into Cambodia before any reporters got into Cambodia, and we were the first people to discover the killing fields. And so, even though we didn't know what we were doing, we had absolutely no news experience. Um, we were stumbling from one big scoop to the next, and they couldn't get rid of us. I think they wanted to, but, but they couldn't. And so we had uh, a 13-year 
run at NBC, um, winning more prizes for them than any reporter has ever won, uh, stories that no other reporters could tell, and it ended with a report that I'll show you next. And uh, this is a report from Iraq. Um, anybody ever been to war? Wow, it's lucky, it's a different generation. Uh, if you would ask that question to a room full of people from Russia 20 years ago, lots of hands would go up. Uh, and you're lucky. Uh, anybody ever been to a war zone? What do you mean? War. You ever been to a place where there's a war? Fight, or you were there by accident, or you were a tourist and the war started? How would that be Captain different 20 years ago? It's a different generation, people from uh, World War II. I'm about 20 years old, though. Afghanistan. <laughs> Uh -huh. yeah. uh, but there were a lot of people who had some relation. The teachers would raise their hands because they would have all been involved in the war and things like that. My, my, here, sure. My father, my, my father's generation. If I would have come here, right. My father was alive. Then anyway, what I, I'm just saying, you guys are lucky because you're 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 one of the first generations from this country that hasn't had to experience the horror of war. Tell you about the war? That you get used to it. Get used to the war. The United States um, has been involved in a lot of wars recently, but they've all been fought outside the United States. And it was the policy of the public officials to try to control the news that comes back from these war zones. And so, for example, in the first Gulf War, the first time the United States invaded Iraq, this was presented to the American people as the first bloodless war. The uh, generals would go on television every day, and they would have uh, a TV monitor that would show the cockpit images from the airplanes or the images from the missiles as they landed in Baghdad and you'd see a bridge, and then all of a sudden you'd see whoosh, whoosh, and the bridge would blow up. Or you'd see a radio tower, and that would get blown up. And around the third or fourth day of the war, one of the reporters got up at one of these press conferences and said, General, um, you've shown us only these um, perfect hits of complete accuracy, and I'm wondering if any of these weapons have ever missed their target. I'm wondering if, if there have been any civilian deaths or any civilian casualties. And the general says, no, 100% accuracy, no civilian deaths, no civilian casualties. I'm watching this on TV and I start screaming. I almost threw a chair at the, at the television. Because I've been to war zones and there's no such thing as a bloodless war. It just doesn't exist. And when you go to war zones, when you go to places like Nicaragua or Vietnam or the Philippines, and you see the horror of war, if you were to go to Chechnya or someplace like that, it's very important that as a reporter you help people understand what war is like. The United States is a very, very powerful country. And we are sometimes a very dangerous country. And we're even more dangerous if our people are stupid enough to think that there's such a thing as a bloodless war. Because then we're going to be going around kicking in the door of every single country in the world. And we're going to be causing so much harm and so much damage, we're going to make the world a much worse place. So I decided that I want to go to cover this war. And it's a long story, it's a pretty funny story, but I wind up in Baghdad, and there's only one other foreign TV reporter in the country. And when you get there, the Iraqis present you with a list of press restrictions. There's this, it's really kind of interesting. There were two government leaders trying to keep the world from knowing the truth about what was going on in Iraq. And one was President Bush, and the other one was Saddam Hussein. 
It was really weird, because they both were trying to perpetuate the same lie, that this is a bloodless war, for different reasons. Bush was trying to sell this to the American people so he could keep on bombing, and Saddam was trying to sell this to his people because I'm a tough guy. You can't hurt me. <laughs> ha! Didn't hurt me. <laughs> and he wasn't letting the press film what was really going on. So you're not allowed to film a dead body. You're not allowed to film a, a bombed out building. You're not allowed to even turn your camera on without permission from your babysitter. So we said, Jesus, we gotta, we got to figure out and break these rules. Um, if you were reporters, I would teach you how to do this. Um, maybe it's like teaching somebody in economics how to cheat in the stock market or something like that. <laughs> but sometimes we believe that we have to break the rules in order to tell the truth. Sometimes we have to lie to tell the truth. Is that camera off? You yeah. have the camera's off. I'm not what, me filming something. Um, or you come up with some situation, you know, we needed to get the babysitter out of our car. So we all piled into the same car and said that, uh, that our union rules only let us work together in the same car. And so they had to ride me while we're filming out the window. We had a whole series of coughs and sneezes, because every time in those days you turn the camera on, it made some noise. When you press the trigger, it made some noise. So we, and we had our own code amongst ourselves, which would uh, signal to, to one of the people in my team to distract the babysitter. Take the babysitter over there, you know, you fall down and, and, and hurt your foot and start crying and say you have to go to the hospital while we're filming something over here. So it took us about three days to figure out how to break these rules. I didn't tell you the really good ways we do it. Um, but we began to record what this war was really like, that there were people that were getting killed, there were houses that were getting blown up, and there were people suffering. So we're talking about tonight. First of all, mm -hmm. wait a Yes. Anybody have any questions about any of this stuff? Yeah. Uh, uh, what are you trying to tell us about this war? Just uh, that wars are awful, awful thing or not to begin new wars? Um, I'm trying to Because help. if you are telling us uh, that not to begin new wars, uh, why are you telling this? Because there's sometimes uh, it's better to uh, make a war, or, and then go better for some reasons about uh, North Korea. For right. So the reason why I wanted to do this is I wanted people to have more facts and more information and to know the reality so they can make an intelligent decision. I'm not telling them what the decision should be, but they certainly weren't getting all the information. They were getting no information. So I wanted my mother to know what was happening. I wanted the person who lived next door to know what was happening. I didn't want everything to be controlled by a small group of people who were telling us a bunch of lies. And what about the censorship from the part of the channel itself? It's coming. That's, it's coming. This is my house. This is my uh, brother house. Uh oh, another air raid starting. Can you hear the siren? It's my the song. Yes, I, I hear. Mm -hmm. Was anyone hurt in your family? No. Uh, oh, just uh, wounded. Two baby. Two baby. Your baby yes. wounded. This is my uh, neighbor is uh, die too. Because of the shortage of medicine and this, it will affect everybody and she is screaming because her baby has died. What's going to happen to this kid? 
I think that he's going to die in a day or two. I mean, I, I can't do nothing for them because they're very difficult. So they, they ask for your help? And I can't offer the help. And that's it, I mean. And this is another one, huh? Yes. This baby going to die also? Of course. He's going to die in my being an hour. I mean, this is another kid who is suffering from malnutrition and actually I'm nourished. And look at him, he can't, you know, shout because he has no enough energy. And he is, of course, going to die again in two or three days. So he's trying to cry. Yes, but he couldn't. So, um, you wonder what happened when I came back to the United States with that uh, tape? Okay. First, we had to get it out of the country. That was very exciting. Uh, we got intercepted by a bunch of Iraqis who thought that um, I was an American pilot. Um, Saddam Hussein had a bounty on American captured American pilots, uh, dead or alive, $7,000. And one of the guys um, who tried to kill me, um, his house had been blown up the week before he lost his entire family. So he was going to get revenge and he was going to get rich um, by killing me. Uh, luckily, um, his pistol malfunctioned and the uh, bullets jammed in the handle. And so even though he was pulling the trigger and screaming at me and uh, I thought I was going to die. Um, he did succeed in killing me. Uh, and we get out of the country, we bring this stuff to New York, and I show up at NBC, uh, where I've been working for 13 years, and everybody gets really excited because um, they, they when, when the war started, the president of NBC appointed an ex-Marine to be in charge of NBC's news coverage. And when the military told him that he couldn't go there, he didn't go. And when they told him he couldn't do this, he said fine. And he restricted all the other reporters. And so NBC had just been put in this crap on TV that was basically government propaganda. And so I come in with something that's completely different. And the good reporters at NBC are really excited. And they want to broadcast this. And so they decided this is going to be the lead story of the next day's newscast, and that everybody believes that this is going to uh, set off uh, a public policy debate about the war and about the truthfulness of the war and the way, and also the way reporters are being treated. And um, that's why I went to make this report, so that people could see it. And around three o'clock the next day, just before the, you know, the, the final preparations for the newscast, I get a phone call from NBC. And um, I get told that they're not going to broadcast the uh, film and that uh, they're going to fire me. So um, I said, well, you know what? You can't do that on the telephone. Um, I've been to 20 wars for you guys. Um, I've uh, put my life on the line. If you're going to say that, you got to say it to my face. So I go up to the president. He said it to my face. He, you know, he said, listen, every time you go to the third world or any place like this, you make trouble for us, and I'm just tired of it. And so I'm not going to broadcast this report, and this is the last time you're ever going to work for us again. So he fired me. So, um, we failed. I mean, we got into Iraq. We had figured out how to beat the censors. We had managed to get the film back into the United States, but now it's not going to get seen by anybody. And I didn't know what to do. And then I thought, well, there's more than one television network in the United States. When we got blacklisted from public television, I wound up at NBC. Why don't I call up CBS? CBS had always called me every time we beat one of their other reporters. And they would call and they would say, why are you working for that stupid NBC? You better start working for us. 
Um, so I called them and I showed them the, the film and they were quite surprised because nobody had seen anything like this. And so they said, okay, we're going to broadcast this. And um, we welcome you to our team. NBC is going to be sorry that they did this because it's just wrong. And uh, we're going to broadcast this tomorrow night. We'll call you tomorrow morning and we'll give you the details. <clears throat> so I'm sitting in the morning, I'm waiting for them to call me. 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And, you know, I, I, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm really antsy. But I don't want them to think that, like, I'm, I'm nervous about anything. I'm, I want them to think I'm cool. And so I wait till around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I can't wait any longer, so I call him. And I asked to speak to the president of CBS News. He was the guy that shook my hand and welcomed me to the team and decided, made the decision that they were going to broadcast this report. And they said, you can't talk to him. I said, what do you mean I can't talk to him? He said, you can't talk to him. I said, well, I, I have to. And they said, no, you can't. And I said, well, you haven't heard? And I said, no. You've been fired. 2 o'clock in the morning, you got a phone call. So, you talk about censorship, I mean, everybody knew that you better stay away from this film because bad things are going to happen to you. If they fire me, that's not a big deal, but they firing the president of CBS News is a really big deal. And so everybody knew this was too hot to handle. And it was never seen in the United States. Uh, we won all sorts of prizes, the European Peace Award and, and all sorts of things like that. But the people who needed to see it the people from the country that were making the war didn't get a chance to see this. So, any, any uh, comments about that? They never saw it even later? They saw it. There were some programs um, that were criticizing the way the government had treated the news media. So they showed, they showed little clips of it. Um, but like two years later. Guy. I come from the days before there was an internet, and this was, there was no internet broadcasting, there was no YouTube that didn't exist. So there's changes that have occurred that allow for distribution of films. I, I, there's, a, it, there's a story attached to the last clip I'll tell you that, that's about that. But in those days, that was it. And we had three major networks in the United States, uh, and if you didn't get your film on one of those networks, very few people saw it. Why well, couldn't you show it on the street? <coughs> was that direct pressure from the government, or why did it happen? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I have to assume so. I know that um, in the next film I'm going to show you, I know what the direct pressure from the government was. But in this case, um, in order to fire a president of a, of a news network, um, the order's coming from very, some very high place in Washington. Where it came from, I don't know. Yeah. Why couldn't you show it on the streets? I could have. But sometimes you get spoiled, okay? So if, if let's say you're a businessman, and you own, um, what's my favorite store only, M-Video? Okay, you, you own M-Video. And you're used to like a big wholesale network in which you're reaching every citizen. And all of a sudden, you lose your job and you have to stand outside the metro selling like one or two uh, socks or something like that. It, it's hard to make that adjustment. Um, and sometimes we've made that adjustment. But I don't, we, we were trying to reach as many people as possible. Um, and maybe we have been spoiled by our access to the mass media. Um, I'm the only independent reporter who's ever had that type of access, so it's, it's very unusual, and um, maybe we should have shown it, but uh, I mean the war was over pretty fast. And the European audience also saw it afterwards, right? Say again? So for in Europe you also got the battle of that and you showed it also after the war was over, right? Not that much, you know, I mean, I, uh, there, there is now developed in the United States a whole circuit of film festivals. And so you could show uh, a film like this in film festivals, and it wouldn't get a big audience, but at least it would get an audience. And they didn't have that type of network in those days either. 
Um, they uh, barely had cable television in those days. It was just starting to grow. And so the media was really concentrated in very, very few hands uh, in those days. Um, but what I, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. I did go on the streets with this. I forgot. Okay. I did. Okay. So what we did is we built a bus. And the bus was like the, like a giant city bus. And, it, and, and I got a, uh, one of these video walls, like we have in Times Square, like you have for advertising. And we attached this to the side of the bus. And we built a TV studio in the bus. And at that time, there were sort of, um, this was for the second Gulf War, not the first one. The, there were three places that were really um, affecting the thoughts of every American. One was Ground Zero and the terrorism that uh, we had suffered and that my neighborhood had suffered because I, I uh, live and work 10 blocks from Ground Zero. I spent all that day at Ground Zero. Uh, I was the only camera at Ground Zero for the first day and a half. And so all the pictures of what was going on uh, are my pictures. Uh, and I was deeply affected by it. There's a, there's a certain smell that uh, that war has, uh, and it's um, uh, explosives, some type of dampness, I don't know why, and, and dry blood. And when I was coming up uh, from the World Trade Center to bring my uh, films to the TV station, I was on my motorcycle because it was the only way you could get around the city because everything was roadblocked. And I could get around the roadblocks on my motorcycle but not in a car. And when you drive on a motorcycle, I don't know if anybody's been on a motorcycle, but the air goes through your nose faster and it accelerates all the smell. So if somebody's smoking a cigar, 10 cars up, you can smell it. And I could smell that smell of war, the blood and the wetness and the explosives. And, and even now when I talk about it, right, I'm getting goosebumps. And I had to get off my motorcycle because I never thought I was going to smell that in my own neighborhood. So we took the films from Ground Zero. We went to Iraq that year and made films about what was going on in Iraq. And we also went into Afghanistan and made films about what was going on in Afghanistan. And we took these films on this big bus with a big video wall. We drove across the United States and we came to small towns all across America. And we called everybody to the center of town, like Lenin Square, and showed these films and had town meetings to talk about people's opinions. So um, I actually did, it took me a while, but I went back to the streets. Could you also have approached universities? The universities? To show films? I guess we could. I mean, um, in order to do that, you have to be really well organized. I'm not so well organized. I'm, I, I'm pretty good at making the films, but I'm not that good at organizing the distribution of the films. And so that's why I liked making these Faustian bargains with the big television networks so that um, in exchange for a little bit of my soul I could get a big audience uh, and to, for, for me to undertake that type of distribution um, I'm, I'm just not good at that stuff and the, in, it's better now but in those days all the distributors cheated the filmmakers they all kept two sets of books um, and the first distributor we had just never gave us any money, uh, stole all the money. Um, I have no idea if anybody ever saw the films, but I do know that, that she stole a lot of money from us. And the second guy stole the money until we figured out that he had stolen it. Um, and so I think my friend in the back presumes that I might be nonviolent, uh, but that would be uh, a misassumption on his part. And so um, I knew the guy had stolen from us. And I sat him down and I said, I want you to tell me the truth about uh, what's happened to our money. And he lied to me. And I just took my hockey stick out and I banged it on the table like this. And I said, you have one more chance. And he told me the truth. So we, we knew how much money he stole from us. So I'm not nonviolent. Um, so, um, United States decided it's going to go to war in Iraq again. And the press was really frustrated by the way they've been treated in the 
first war. And the military, they, they complained to the military and they came up with a new system. It's called embedding, getting into the bed with the military, in which you become part of a military unit. Uh, and they're supposed to protect you, but they're supposed to let you film whatever you want to film. And I, I didn't think this was such a great idea because I had seen the military line war after war. And why would they change and tell, why would they let me, of all people, go there and film what I want to film? But it was the only way to get into Iraq. The only way to survive and not just go there on a suicide mission. And so we applied to embed with the military. And at this particular time, this is now another President Bush, the second President Bush, um, was our president. So the first Bush took us to war in one Iraq war, and the second Bush took us to another war in Iraq. And the second Bush was also uh, trying to control the press, even though they had this embedded system. Um, you could not take pictures of dead soldiers. Same thing as what Saddam was doing. Um, when a soldier's body comes into the United States, it comes on a special plane that lands in Maryland at Dover Air Force Base. And when the press wants to show that lots of Americans are dying, they camp out there and they wait for the planes and they take pictures of all these coffins coming off. And there were a lot of coffins. And they kick the press out of there. Uh, there's a special part of our national cemetery in Washington, Arlington National Cemetery, where they bury the soldiers who die in Iraq and Afghanistan. They kick the press out of there too. So, well, there's numbers and there's pictures. And I want pictures. I want people to see their neighbor dead uh, so that, they, again, they can understand the cost of the war. And they can say, oh, mm -hmm. 10 soldiers died this week. It's not the same as seeing it. So we proposed to the military to do a documentary about military medicine. We figured at least we'd get near some people that were wounded. And we proposed uh, to go to 20 different locations in Iraq. This was a big mistake. Uh, and we wanted to go to a little field hospital. We wanted to go to this nurse center over here. And we submitted this list and they accepted it. But the first place we went was the main army hospital in Baghdad. And this is the place where all the trauma victims come. So if you get hit by a roadside uh, explosion, you're coming to this hospital. If you get shot, you're coming to this hospital. I was there for 15 minutes, and I hear, ch -ch 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 -ch, and in comes the medevac helicopter, and they bring these guys out. They don't even look like people anymore. They just look like hamburger. And that day, I saw two amputations, and the next day, I saw another amputation. Um, I've seen lots of people die from the first time that man died in the hospital. Um, and I've forgotten a lot of the people that I've seen dead. I've never forgotten these amputations. When you see somebody get their arm or leg cut up, you just never, ever, ever forget it. And every 50 minutes they're bringing in more people. And what we were, we were at the bottom of the funnel. And they're bringing them more to us. And the only thing we needed to do in order to capture what was going on in the war was to be able to stay there. But we were only scheduled to be there for three days. And so that was our big fight, was to be able to stay there. And after three days, I knew the commander of the base uh, came to work every day at 5 o'clock. And at 4.30, I'm waiting outside his office, 4.30 in the morning. What are you doing here, John? And I said, well, I wanted to talk to you about the job you guys are doing. Do you think the people back in the United States appreciate the sacrifices that you're making, the dangers that uh, you have to face, how hard you're working to save people's lives? And he says, no, they don't have any idea at all. I said, do you want them to know that? And he says, yeah, they're really, they'd be great. And I said, well, I can't tell that story in three days. If you give me more time, I can tell that story. And so he let us stay. And so here's an example of um, what we filmed in the hospital. Does he have a line? All right, I've got a 16 right in there. X-rays? Go ahead and shoot it. Chest X-ray? Yes, thank you. Yes, sir, we are going to take him to the alarm. Not good. 
He's got a bullet right there in his chest, uh, right by his mediastinum, that uh, involves some very large structures. Okay. You guys, we got a hot one coming. One, two, and three. How are we doing up there, folks? Okay. His heart is still beating, but it's a muscle sparing type of decision at this point. 21 year old American active duty soldier. I don't know if he's a Marine or, or he's a Marine. They're doing a repair of the pulmonary artery right now, but they have it under control and his blood pressure's back, so we're doing good. So far, so good. Just keep your fingers crossed. Good, good job on that. That's good save. I think everyone gave it their best effort, so now we'll just have to see it's in God's hands and his body's hands. So let's go check a look at it. I can feel a pulse in his foot now. Man, that's awesome.
this was one of four or five uh, American soldiers that died uh, on camera in this film. Uh, this was a nice big kid from upstate New York. Um, we became friends with his mother. Um, and actually it was kind of tough because um, in, in America, um, you have privacy rights. Uh, but your privacy rights end when you die. So, um, we didn't need to get a release from him. But, um, how can you put something like that on TV and his mother turns on the TV and sees your kid die on camera? Uh, you just can't do that. Um, there were some other guys that died on camera, but they were just so chopped up um, that um, I just felt it was unethical and inhuman to show what they look like, even though it would certainly help people understand what war was like, and so we concealed their faces. But this kid came off the helicopter, and um, he was standing when he came off the helicopter. He just had a nick in the wrong place. Um, and he was handsome, and uh, he fought really hard, and they tried to save him. So I thought, this is the perfect person to be a, be a person, to have a name, to have a face, and to end the film, and you can see this end, they wheel the kid out and it pans over, there's an American flag behind the bed. Um, we didn't plan it, but um, the television gods had prepared that scene for us like that. And we called the mother up and asked her if she wanted to see this, and she came in and she watched it. And she gave us permission to put it on television, but she didn't want the identity of her son revealed. Um, so. You see people talking to him, but we actually had to blow the picture up and expand the picture so that um, his face came off the screen. And that's why it's a little fuzzy. It's fuzzy for that technical reason that you guys wouldn't know, but um, <coughs> we, we concealed this. But nevertheless, um, this was stuff that nobody had seen. It really brought the cost of the war home. And the Secretary of the Army called up the president of HBO and said, don't you dare show that film. So you asked about the censorship. This, we know who was calling. It was the Secretary of the Army. And he threatened HBO and said that there was a law that was going through Congress and if they changed some of the words in this law, it was going to cost HBO millions and millions of dollars. And we, we wanted to make sure that the president of HBO did the right thing. So we leaked this to the New York Times. And so um, the president of HBO sort of knew that all the eyes were on him. But I mean, I think in the end, he would have done the right thing anyway. And, and I know what he said. Uh, he said to the, to the um, head of the army, go fuck yourself, and hung the phone up. <laughs> so when that happened, they began messing around with the legislation in Washington to try to hurt HBO. They also did some other really interesting things. Um, there was a, a series, do you know what the name of it was, Mary? The one with the Tom Hanks with uh, about the war in Europe? It was like a ten-part series. Um, Band of Brothers. Huh? Band of Brothers. What? Band of Brothers, right? Yeah. So, um, they had, HBO had done this very successful film about World War II called Band of Brothers, and they were going to now do the same thing about the people who fought in the Pacific. It was going to be called the Pacific. And they had negotiated a deal with the military in which the military was going to supply all the ships and the planes and all the stuff that HBO didn't have, but only the military had, so that this would look realistic. But Gosh, they did so many evil things. I'm only telling this one. So they were going to wait for HBO to bring all the actors out to the Pacific, get all these guys on the clock with millions of dollars every day, ding, 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 and then not supply any of the planes and the boats that they said. They're really going to screw HBO. It probably would have cost them about $50 million. Um, we were supposed to uh, do a documentary about the main army hospital in Washington. We had 12 uh, filmmakers that were going to spend 24 hours in this hospital. And the day before everybody was supposed to film, when everybody was in Washington, when everybody had been paid, they 
withdrew access to the hospital. So they were really after HBO. Fortunately, um, this Secretary of the Army was just a real dummy. And um, there was a big scandal in this main army hospital. There were rats everywhere. They were tying up the wounded soldiers so that they wouldn't. I mean, they were, it was a disgrace. And these were the people that had sacrificed their arms, their legs, their eyes for America. And they were being treated like dogs in a kennel. And the secretary, when the, the newspapers exposed this, he says, whoa, whoa, what's the big problem? So that was it for him. He was gone. And what was interesting is the next day, we got a phone call from one of our friends in the public relations department in the Army. And he apologized and he confessed. Because he told us all, we never would have known about any of these evil plans. And he said, this is what we were going to do to you guys. This is what we were going to do. And we're all ashamed. Because you told the truth about this <coughs> war. And you told it in a way that honored us. Um, these doctors, maybe you don't agree with the war, but they, they're heroes. And they're trying as hard as they can to save people's lives, whether it's American life or Iraqi lives. And we treated them with respect and with dignity and showed the horror of the war. And so the military has actually embraced this film. And anybody who wants to join the Army has to watch it. And if you would have asked me if something like that would have been possible, I would have said it's absolutely impossible. We've made some other really, really anti-war films. And the military has embraced these films too. Because they know <coughs> that when there's a war, they're the ones that pay the price. So how about one more film, and then we can go home? Huh? Okay. Um, this is in China. Um, and somebody asked, um, why didn't you put something on the internet? So we'll, this has a connection to that at the end. But they had a terrible earthquake in China. And uh, this was in Sichuan. It was during the time of the Olympics. Um, you know that um, you think Russia's like trying to put its best foot forward and have the world think Russia's uh, like a really wonderful, wonderful company and is, everything's wrapped up with the Olympics. Every single country does this. Um, it's nothing peculiar to Russia. The United States does it. If we have homeless people in Salt Lake City, and we're having Olympics in Salt Lake City. They're going to take all these people and they're going to put them someplace. They did it in Korea. All the homeless people in Korea, all the small businesses, all got taken away. Um, they do it every time. And coincidentally, they let reporters in the country when they don't normally let reporters in the country. And so there were a lot of reporters in the country when the earthquake happened. And we went to Sichuan. But we got there a little bit late. We came to China about a week after the earthquake. And they had done, a, a, I think, a very commendable job of cleaning up the towns, rehousing people, much better than the United States did during Hurricane Katrina. Are you guys all familiar with um, um, how terrible the government behaved during the hurricane? Just horrible. Chinese did a much better job. And it just didn't seem like there were that many stories to tell. But we became of, uh, aware of one thing, that in many towns, the buildings in the town survived the earthquake, with one exception. And the exception was the local schools. Because the schools were all built by the local corrupt public officials. And when the budget came to build the schools, they put half the money in their pocket, and built the schools out of junk. And the earthquake happened at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when all the kids were in school. And so the only buildings that collapsed in these towns were the schools. The kids were buried alive. And in this one particular town, the parents came rushing to the school. The kids were lying under the rubble, calling on their cell phones, Mommy, Daddy, save me. And they had no heavy equipment because the corrupt local public official, when the government called, do you need any help? Nope, everything's under control. And so all the heavy equipment passed by the town and the kids died. And the parents believed that there was something wrong with this. 
So they went down to the school and they sat there. They took pictures of their kids and they placed them on the destroyed school. And they waited for the government officials to come and talk to them and nobody came. And finally they decided that they needed answers. In China there's a tradition of petitioning the emperor. Um, so you guys have a, 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 a once a year, um, who goes on TV and anybody can ask him a question. Um, and, and we have the same thing. Uh, you know, I'm not saying this because um, Putin is different from um, other leaders. Um, you can go to some of um, Barack Obama's um, when he visits college campuses and ask him questions. And there's a tradition in China of going to petition the emperor with your grievance. And so um, I'm driving down the road at 6 o'clock in the morning, and coming out of the farm is what looks like this long ghost. And I, I stop the car, and I get out, and it's 130 parents from this school, each carrying a photograph of their dead child on their way to Beijing, which is 2,000 miles away, to try and talk uh, to the government to see if they get some justice.
anybody have any questions about that? Yeah. So do you have an interpreter? And what do you usually do when you don't speak the language? Uh, had an interpreter uh -huh. who actually um, spoke the, the dialect from that particular province. So that was good. What's interesting is that um, the parents were doing something really dangerous. Doing this in China is uh, risking a lot. Uh, but they got to the point where they sort of had nothing to lose. Their kids have been killed. China's a one-child country. Uh, you're, you're dependent on your child to take care of you in your old age. And basically, these people were ruined in, in many different ways. And so they didn't care. But when they saw me, they had to make a decision. Who's this guy, like, looks like he's from Mars, who's landed here on the side of the road in China with this big camera, um, and, and they look in your eyes, and there's like about three seconds in which um, they have to decide whether they're going to trust you, and they decided to trust me. Um, and they also, um, they saw that when we're in the middle of all these beatings and stuff like that, 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 that we were going to stick with them. Um, I promised them that I would tell their story as best I could. And it became increasingly difficult to tell the story. Because what's interesting is you look here and you can see while this is going on, there are people standing there with their cell phone cameras, taking pictures of this. This is something new that didn't exist in a previous generation. Um, there were local Chinese reporters that tried to tell the story. But when the government pushed back, the first people they targeted were the local Chinese reporters, and they all disappeared. And all the material was confiscated. Uh, then they went after all the foreign reporters. Uh, it, it's, I don't know why they do this, but the Chinese government likes to take and bring you to like a second class hotel, uh, break your equipment, beat you up for a couple of days, and then kick you out of the country. Uh, and so they did this to the Italian uh, crew and to the Japanese crew. And um, I knew they were coming after me because they had already threatened me. Um, so I had shipped all our tapes already back to the United States and was just trying to, to get a good ending to the program. The ending was going to be on International Children's Day, which is when the government had promised to give a report to the parents. And this was going to be the ironic ending of our film on the day that celebrates children, we knew the parents were going to get screwed. And we were going to film this, but um, it turns out that there were 20 parents waiting for the report and 60 secret policemen waiting for us. And so uh, we decided that was it. We're not filming anymore. Uh, we're going to make the film from what we've already sent back to the United States. And this last scene would be great, but let's get out of the country. Came back. Um, you, know, you guys are all going to have bosses, uh, no matter what you do. Um, always buy them souvenirs. They like it. And they'll let you make another film. Uh, so we went to the local supermarket, and we got a couple of bags full of souvenirs to bring back to New York. And um, all of a sudden, we're going to our car, and some guy pops up and grabs uh, one of our interpreters and starts hauling him away. And say, hey, what are you doing? And I grab the guy. And all of a sudden, five guys pop up, and they all have guns. Well, that's interesting. And, and boop, another five. They had 35 secret police that had been waiting for us in, in, in this garage. Who knows how long they had been following us. Um, and they dragged us off to the police station. And they wanted the films. And I said, well, I'd really love to let you have the films, but they're already back in New York. Whatever you do to us can't stop the film. So they thought about this. The, the guys from the big city knew that they better let us go. That they probably it would backfire if they if they beat us up. But the local guys, wow, they really wanted to beat us up. And you could just tell. And they were sitting there, sort of like smacking their fists, uh, like hoping that they would get a chance to do it. But um, when we promised we would leave on the next plane, they let us go. So we come back to the United States. Um, this film's a pretty good film. Uh, it was nominated for an Academy Award. Um, huh? Say it again? To what happened to the Nothing happened to our, the, our... I brought the interpreters from the United States. So everybody left. And the parents? We're coming to that, okay? 
So, um, five, five films are, um, are, are, the, are the final nominees for the Academy Award. Um, and we've been nominated uh, on other occasions, um, but this year we had the best film. This, this was really a strong film um, that told the story of these hero parents. Um, and HBO was excited about this film. Uh, they hired a very um, clever public relations agent. They were going to do a lot of publicity. Um, and we were going to show this film to, to the world. So the Academy Award nominations come out. It's a live television program broadcast around the world. And it's being carried live on Chinese television. And when they announced that China's a natural disaster <coughs> is nominated, <laughs> every TV set all across China goes black. And they pull the plug on the Academy show. Okay. Somehow, some, this, this filtered back, not to somebody at HBO, but to the parent company, Time Warner, which is the largest American information company, media conglomerate. And somebody said, wait a minute, we sell stuff to China. We're one of the few American companies that actually has a positive cash flow. We don't make cars, we don't make refrigerators. The Chinese make that cheaper, but they can't make our entertainment programs. And they said, why, why in the world are we doing this? And they yanked everything, okay? So no more publicity. We're told not to talk to the press. Um, when this program was broadcast on HBO, it was basically broadcast silently, with no publicity at all, and they didn't support us um, in the Academy Award um, contest. If they would have supported us, um, I'm, I'm sure we would have won. We went anyway, and uh, maybe it's a good thing that we didn't win because we had t-shirts um, with uh, pictures of the dead children underneath our suits. And we had a big poster in large Chinese characters, Justice for the Murdered Children and Their Parents. And had we won, we were going to get up and we were going to unfurl this banner and open up our shirts. Uh, I'm certain it would have been the last time we ever worked for HBO, but um, we lost. Uh, so what happened to the parents? Um, we had pledged to the parents that we would keep fighting for them. And we stayed in contact. And what was really interesting is two things. Within three months, every single parent had seen this program because they figured out how to see it on the internet. Um, they had all been visited by the government in the middle of the night and threatened. Uh, and they all told us, don't stop, please keep fighting. Um, so uh, it's interesting that the internet sort of, in a serpentine way, can penetrate even into this village in the middle of nowhere in China. And it's also interesting that the parents wanted us to keep fighting. Um, so it, 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 it made us feel good. We're still in touch with them. Uh, in fact, we're in touch with just about everybody we've ever filmed. Uh, we, we, it sort of becomes one big family. Um, they call me all the time to let me know what's going on. I call them, um, and, and they're all my friends. So anybody have any last questions? Yeah? What are you working on now? Okay. <laughs> so somebody asked me this question that we were at um, uh, Stankanet TV this afternoon. <coughs> so I told them, and, and you would have thought that I set off a bomb in the room. So we're working on a film about the, the gay rights movement in Cuba. And right, everybody's going to start to chuckle. And, uh, what happened in Cuba, Cuba, the Cuban Revolution was a very progressive revolution in many ways. It um, um, made opportunities for health care and for school that we envied in the United States. Um, but they were extremely homophobic. Um, and Fidel Castro and Raul Castro declared that uh, homosexuality was bourgeois decadence. And they could fix that by putting the homosexuals in concentration camps. So they rounded up the gay men and they put them in concentration camps for the first two years of the revolution. Um, they also um, kicked you out of the Communist Party. They, if, if you guys in the university
was the, uh, you didn't even have to be gay, but if you were suspected of being gay, kick you out of the university. Uh, if you were a sports person, kick you off the teams. Um, so, um, there was a lot of suffering that went on in Cuba. And around five or six years ago, Mariela Castro, she's the daughter of Raul, who is now the president of Cuba, and the niece of Fidel, I've um, heard so many stories of this suffering, had friends who had suffered, and she says, wrong. And I can change it, because I'm the president's daughter. And they went from being one of the most repressive, homophobic countries in the hemisphere to one of the most progressive. Their laws um, are more inclusive now than American laws. They have uh, gay marriage. They have gay adoption. Um, and it's the president's daughter. Now, a lot of the country is resisting this. And that's what makes the film very interesting because it's a Catholic country, very macho country, and Mariella has taken the dial and going like this. And you can see the change right in front of your eyes. And you can see the resistance right in front of your eyes. So that's the, the film I'm making. And so I said that, and the uh, nice woman who was our host in Ostakana jumped in and goes, Why are you talking about that here? Why are you talking about gays? Whoa, 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 whoa. She was like, oh gosh, you know, she was having a heart attack. So uh, that's the film we're working on now. Uh, I'm probably going to go back to Cuba in uh, March to finish it. But, yeah. So all of all the uh, over these years that you worked on the uh, reporting, um, you faced a lot of different kinds of censorship. Is it getting better or worse uh, to get the message from the field to the people over the, all these years? Um, I, I don't think it's a simple answer. Um, we've had um, we had problems with this uh, show about China. We had problems with another show about um, this company that got taken over by a hedge fund. Very interesting film for you people interested in hedge funds and business to see. Uh, it turns out that the head of the hedge fund was the brother-in-law of the president of HBO's parent company. So that film had uh, some, some problems getting released. Um, the current film that's on HBO right now, they're being very supportive of. And it's an interesting film, again, about an economic issue. It's about the people in New York City who do not have jobs because um, all the factories have closed down and all the manufacturing has been shipped overseas. And they have to go through the garbage in order to survive. And in New York, if you collect an empty can or an empty soda bottle, you can get five cents if you bring it back to the store. And we have armies of people in the richest city in the world going through the garbage and surviving them. Like, like the people in the Philippines. It's happening uh, on my block. Um, and they broadcast that. Um, there are opportunities to reach people on the internet that didn't exist before. But how do you support yourself? <coughs> in, in our center we have 25, 30 people because the money that we get from HBO, we hire teachers to teach our local high school students how to make films. We buy cameras for the people in the neighborhood so they can make films. Um, and if you put something on the internet, um, unless it's pornography, um, they haven't figured out how to monetize it. The, the pornographers know how to make a lot of money on the internet, but social, social justice films um, aren't a, uh, a good commodity. So there's good things and there's bad things, but everybody knows that the media landscape is changing. Um, sometime around <coughs> 13 months from now, there is going to be a seminal moment in, in media in which the number of people that consume their media via computers and telephones equals the number of people who watch it traditionally on television. And it's only going to change more away from television. And so the model that we're using right now in order to support ourselves is a dinosaur. When we contract with HBO, it's like we're contracting with a brontosaurus. And the ice age is coming for that type of animal. And, and I don't know how we're going to survive, and I don't know how HBO's going to survive. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely different world that's coming. One more question? Okay. So, 
Um, I'd like to thank you guys for letting me come here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you guys all know Olga, Olga and you? Do they, do they really all know you? Okay. So Olga works here at the college. She has a collection of all our films. And so if you guys want to see the films, uh, you can go see her. Center for New Media and Society. The Center for New Media and Society, housed here in your university. Who knew? Right? <laughs> but, it, but it's just started here. Um, Olga had, had another center uh, for journalists uh, in extreme situations, and she started this new organization and was asked to bring it uh, to, to the university. So you have this resource available to you. But, but, but is it true that you do have a collection of the films here? Yes. And would you let these people see them if they wanted to? I would love to. <coughs> okay. If you allow. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I've been talking too much. And if any of you want to get involved in the initiative uh, to work with people with disabilities, um, Olga is also the point person on that. Uh, Mary Shea is here. And Mary Shea uh, is uh, instrumental in an organization called FLEX. What's FLEX stand for? Future Leaders Exchange. Future Leaders Exchange. Okay, so if you consider, are they um, too old or are they? Oh. Yeah, but there are some university opportunities. Uh-huh. American Councils for International Education. So if you're interested in exchanging yourself, <laughs> and, and, and getting a chance to to go to the states, Mary is uh, is your yeah. And uh, Karina was was uh, part of, of Flex um, and found it to be a valuable experience. Um, I like people seeing things for themselves. Um, you know, I make uh, my whole life around showing people things, but if you can see things for yourself, it's even better. So, thanks a lot. Uh, you can come visit us anytime you want in Chinatown. Um, where's my hat? Olga's holding up my hat. It's got a picture of our firehouse on it. Uh, it's located in Chinatown. It's called Downtown Community TV Center. So, if you guys look on the internet for Downtown Community TV Center or DCTV, uh, DCTV's web address is DCTVNY. <laughs> Org, and you can learn about our other activities, and anybody who is in New York, welcome to come visit us, okay? <laughs>